It's a pleasure to welcome everybody here today uh, to uh, this lunchtime talk at the Bard Graduate Center in our virtual space. Um, I want to acknowledge that the Bard Graduate Center uh, on the island of Manhattan, Manahata, is in Lenape Hokan, the ancestral lands of the Lenny Lenape people. And I want to not just acknowledge it with those words, but also to read some lines from a poem that was written by Campbell McGrath uh, for a BGC publication, What is Research, and was published last April in The New Yorker called it At the Ruins of Yankee Stadium. And it speaks to what acknowledgement is about. So two passages <clears throat> from the poem. Certainly this is not the eternal city, but it certainly is imperial, certainly tyrannical, democratic, demagogic, dynastic, anarchic, hypertrophic, hyperreal, an empire of rags and photons, an empire encoded in the bricks from which it was built, each a stamped emblem of its labor-intensive materiality. Hundreds of millions barged down the Hudson each year from the clay pits of Haverstraw and Kingston after the great fire of 1835, a hinterland of dependencies, quarries and factories and arterial truck farms, delivering serum to the muscular heart, a toiling collective of Irish sand hogs and Iroquois beam walkers and Ivorian umbrella vendors collecting kindling for the bonfire that has lured like moths the entire world to its blaze. And then a few lines further down, acorns tossing them into the Hudson River from a bench as I did when I was Peter Stuyvesant, when I was Walt Whitman, when we were of the Lenape and Broadway, our hunting trail. Then the deer vanished, the docks decayed, the towers fell. The African graveyard was buried beneath concrete as the memory of slavery has been obscured by metonymy and willful amnesia. And with that, to today's lunchtime speaker, Dr. Jonathan Michael Square, who is a faculty member on the Committee on Degrees in History and Literature at Harvard University. And before that, he was a lecturer in the history department at the University of Pennsylvania. BA from Cornell in history and comparative literature and MA from Texas Austin in Latin American studies and a PhD from NYU in history with a focus on Brazil in the 19th century, slavery, imprisonment, and freedom. Um, he's published extensively uh, for a young scholar in the history of the experience of slavery and its relationship to fashion. Uh, some publications, their titles just to orient you, Laying the Groundwork, 18th and 19th Century Enslaved Fashion Makers, uh, which is gonna be published or is just published by Bloomsbury in Black Fashion Designers in American Fashion and A Stain on an All American Brand, How Brooks Brothers Once Clothed Enslaved People in a volume entitled American Every Day, Resistance, Revolution, Transformation. He's been involved in curated exhibitions on this topic, uh, just to give you some sampling titles, Slavery in the Hands of Harvard, 2019, Freedom from Truth, Self-Portraits of Nell Painter, also 2019, Odalisque Atlas, White History as Told Through Art, and coming up at the Winterthur Museum, Garden and Library, Revolutions and Reckonings. He also has a very active digital humanities presence uh, as the founder and creative director of Fashion and the Self in Slavery and Freedom and the co-founder of Rendering Revolution. Uh, he's taught courses with titles such as Museums and Material Culture, Fashion and Slavery, and Take Back the Museum. Uh, and at Penn, at the early part of his career, he lectured on colonial Latin America and on the history of Brazil. Uh, and today we're excited to hear about his work on Brooks Brothers and its relationship to slavery in the United States. And it's my pleasure to introduce and give the floor, if we can talk about floors in the Zoom world, to Dr. Square. Great. Wow, thank you for that introduction. And thank you for reading that beautiful poem. It was a great way to start off um, this talk. Um, so I just wanna say that it's an honor and pleasure to present my research in this forum. I love talking about my research because every time I talk, like present it, I learn something new about my research based on 
like the questions and comments that I get. So it's really just a pleasure to be here. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. So today I'm going to present a chapter from my book project that's on Brooks Brothers and Brooks Brothers connection to enslavement. So I do want to start off just talking about my digital humanities project um, that was mentioned earlier. Um, I'm very active on social media and this is just a screenshot um, of the, the project's website. It's an outgrowth of my pedagogy. I taught a class called Fashion in the Self in Slavery and Freedom. And there was a social media component to that class. And since teaching a class, the project has taken on a life of its own. You know, start out on Facebook, now I'm on Instagram and YouTube and Twitter. And a lot of my work I share very actively on social media. And I think of my um, book project, um, which is titled Negro Cloth, How Slavery Broke the Global Fashion Industry, as being sort of a analog counterpoint to my digital work. Um, so today I'm going to present the second chapter from this book, which is on how Brooks Brothers was involved in, in clothing, clothing enslaved people. So let's talk about fashion and slavery. Um, you know, often people don't associate fashion with slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. We have positive connotations with, with fashion. We associate it with creativity, expression, autonomy, self-determination, and all of those things are the antithesis of slavery, which is the extreme deprivation of freedom and selfhood. But enslaved people in the US and across the Atlantic Basin, whether it's in South America, you know, Central America, the Caribbean, North America, um, enslaved people use fashion um, to fight for more freedom and to express their multifarious identities. So when I tell people that I study connections between um, the fashion system and histories of enslavement, their reaction is, well, didn't enslaved people simply wear rags? And that certainly was the case often, but in some cases, enslaved people were able to sort of um, get more elaborate, more extensive wardrobes. Um, so the next few slides will discuss how that was possible. So enslaved people received sometimes shapeless ready-made garments or lengths of shadowly made undyed cottons and linens that are referred to as Negro cloth. And actually you have a chapter on Negro cloth in my book project. And it's also the namesake of my book project, Negro Cloth. And with this Negro Cloth, enslaved people were responsible for hand sewing their own clothing. Sometimes with these fabrics, enslaved people um, were able to fashion their own garments using a variety of natural dyes. It's also to, important to remember that enslaved people were able to gain small amounts of money on days off, like Sundays or at night after work. Um, they raised vegetables, or poultry, hunted fish, engaged in artisanal work. And with this small amount of extra money, they sometimes bought clothing and accessories. There was also a, a thriving secondhand market for clothing. Um, so enslaved people bought, sold, and bartered garments on the secondhand clothing market. And if you look at runaway slave ads, you often see um, references not only to what an enslaved person was wearing on their backs at the time, but also the clothing that they took with them. So clothing often served as a form of currency. And with the clothing that they took with them, their own clothing is sometimes the clothing of their enslaved slavers. They were able to buy food or passage or um, lodging. Sometimes enslaved people received cast-offs from their enslavers, so 
use clothing that the enslavers no longer wanted. And lastly, overseers, enslaved domestics, our favorite and our productive enslaved people received fine garments that were manufactured in Europe or the Northeast, as was the case of two Brooks Brother coats that would be the focus of this talk. But before I go into um, the specificities of my research, I do want to talk about the company Brooks Brothers, because it's, it's central um, to this research. I want to start off with doing just a visual analysis of this image. This is, of course, Donald Trump and Barack Obama on the day of Donald Trump's inauguration. And as we know, they're two very different politicians. But what I find really striking about this image is that they're both outfitted in Brooks Brothers. In fact, Brooks Brothers is a company that's often associated with the American presidency. Um, and so it's traditionally American presidents have worn Brooks Brothers on inauguration days. Um, so think about like Abraham Lincoln, when he was shot, um, he was wearing a Brooks Brothers coat. JFK was also wearing a Brooks Brothers button down shirt when he was assassinated. Um, as you can see here, Donald Trump and Barack Obama are both wearing Brooks Brothers. In fact, um, let's see, next slide. 40 out of 46 American presidents have been outfitted by Brooks Brothers. And so I'm gonna give you a quick pop quiz. <laughs> Which six presidents are missing from this list? I'll give you a moment to think about it. Bear in mind that Brooks Brothers was founded in 1818. So the first three American presidents weren't able to be outfitted by Brooks Brothers. So that's why George Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson aren't on the list. You might also notice that Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter are not on the list. Ronald Reagan, as you know, was an actor before going into politics. And many of his connections, his tailor, was based in Los Angeles. And Brooks Brothers is often associated with the Northeast. For that reason, it wasn't a brand that he ever um, gravitated towards or worked with. Jimmy Carter was very thrifty. And apparently, he just wore the same suits that he'd worn before he was an uh, American president. So he didn't work with Brooks Brothers. Our current president, Joe Biden, his go-to brand is Ralph Lauren. He wore Ralph Lauren at his inauguration. So as far as I know, Joe Biden has, hasn't been outfitted by, by Brooks Brothers. And part of me wonders if he if, if he knows of Brooks Brothers history and might feel compelled to steer clear, steer, steer clear um, of you know this brand. So okay. So let's talk about the coats that are the focus of this chapter and the focus of this talk. These are the coats. They are in the permanent collection of the historic New Orleans collection. And they were bought by a man named William Newton Mercer. William Newton Mercer was born into a wealthy family in Baltimore in the late 18th century. He studied medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and after graduating, he enlisted in the army as a surgeon. He was first stationed in New Orleans and later um, was stationed in Natchez, Mississippi. In Natchez, he set up a private practice and he also married into a very wealthy planter family that had been in Mississippi for several generations. They owned four plantations and after marrying into this family, his father-in-law died, and then his wife died, and he subsequently inherited all of the wealth of his family. He was already doing very well for himself because he was born wealthy, um, had a, a private practice in Natchez, but when he inherited this family's wealth, it made him astronomically wealthy. He was sort of catapulted into the 
of enslaving families in the American South. So he was quite prominent. He was a bit of an absentee planter. He spent most of his time in New Orleans where he had a mansion on Canal Street. And um, he served as the president of the Bank of Louisiana. Um, so quite prominent um, individual. So I had the opportunity to see these coats in person in a visit to the historic New Orleans collection. And this is just a short video. Um, you don't need to hear the audio. It's just a, a video of um, two curators um, putting the coat back into storage. This coat is quite small, so I suspect that it was probably worn by an enslaved boy. The other coat is larger and was probably worn by an adult male. Um, just the history of the coats themselves, how they made it to the historic New Orleans collection is really interesting. They were found in the attic of a former plantation in a city in Louisiana called St. Francisville and were donated to the historic New Orleans collection. I won't go into the nitty gritty details of that history, but that's also really interesting, sort of the, the 20th century history of these coats. But we're going to focus on the 19th century. So I've had the opportunity to consult the, the papers of William Newton Mercer, which are archived at Louisiana State University. He was a meticulous record keeper. Um, so there's, there's boxes and boxes of his papers. And this particular document is really interesting for a number of reasons. As you can probably tell, this is an inventory of enslaved people. You can see it's separated into four different lists for um, the four different plantations that he owned. And what's particularly curious about this document is that if you look towards the right of the document here, you can see that there's also um, hogs, horses and mules, and cattle um, cataloged. Um, and I think this document just speaks to the inhumanity of enslavement that people, individuals, um, were cataloged alongside um, livestock and animals. But I think this, this document is also important because it, I think it just speaks to the number of enslaved people that William Newton Mercer um, enslaved. Uh, he was, by the time, um, this document is from the 1850s, um, but by the 1860s, he, earned, he owned even more enslaved people. He was, um, a lot of his wealth was um, wrapped up in individuals, human beings. This is um, the label inside of one of the coats. Um, it's a bit faded, but if you squint, you can see that it says Brooks Brothers, Grant Broadway, Grand Street, New York. This is just a, a portrait of William Newton Mercer, just so you can have a visual how he looked. So this is another really interesting document that's also archived in his papers. This is essentially a receipt. William Newton Mercer, as I mentioned, was born in Baltimore. He was educated in, in Pennsylvania at UPenn. Um, so he had a lot of connections that were more in the Northeast. And for that reason, he wasn't in favor of secession from the Union. Um, and that put him at odds with the Confederacy. He spent much of the Civil War actually in New York City. And this document is, is from that time, this time in New York City, 1865. 
And so I used a magnifying tool to zero in on two purchases from Brooks Brothers. Now, I don't know if these two purchases are the coats that are in um, the permanent collection of the historic New Orleans collection, but I do think it's, it's sort of one of those smoking gun documents. It's clear that he was uh, a regular Brooks Brothers customer. And also William Newton Mercer was a bit of a, I don't want to use the word spent thrift, but he had a lot of money and he spent much of it on luxury items. Like, you know, in his papers, there, there are receipts for like Cuban cigars and gourmet groceries and from the French Quarter and Savile Row suiting and jewelry for the women that was in his life. So he, he had a lot of money and he spent a lot of it and a lot of it on fashion for himself, um, for family members, but also for um, enslaved people in his household. What's also really interesting about this document, because I think it sort of shows the clear connection between the American South and the Northeast. Um, so one of William Newton Mercer's accountants was a man named Charles P. Leverett. You can see it towards the top of the document here, Charles P. Leverett. Charles P. Leverett was a, a factor or an accountant. He had a firm in New York City. He was like the go-to accountant for all the wealthy plantation owners in the American South. And he also served as the president of, president of the Bank of New York. Um, so again, just to show you that um, there wasn't a cleavage between the American South and the Northeast, they were intimately linked, particularly when it comes to finances. And we'll talk more about that later in the presentation, thinking about the company Brooks Brothers and its location in New York City, which I think is really important. This is a document that's also archived um, in William Newton Mercer's papers. Um, having been someone who's, who's looked at handwritten documents from the 18th and 19th century in, in English and in Portuguese, I must say, what I love about this writing is that it's very legible. It's often the case you get a document and you can barely read, but this is like clear, crystal clear, which I love. Um, but this is a, a letter from a man named Wilmer Shields, who served as, you can think of him as being a director of operations for William Newton Mercer's four plantations. Like I said, Mercer was a bit of an absentee planter. He spent most of his time in New Orleans, and if not New Orleans, then New York City. And so Wilmer Shields, who was a plantation owner in his own right, was the person charged with looking over the four plantations. So they had a running correspondence for a number of years. Um, and, um, you know, this is a letter that was sent in, also in 1865. And Wilmer Shields writes to Mercer saying the following, I propose to give the medals to Caesar, Ellen, Frank, and perhaps Bessie. They have been perfectly underlined, faithful to you, far more, far more so than when um, Frank, when he was here. The medals coming from you would be, from me would be, but little valued from you greatly. Now, what's interesting about this document is that um, he's suggesting that Mercer buy medals, probably in New York to a war to formerly enslaved people. Remember, this is 1865. This is after the passing of the Emancipation Proclamation. So the, the Caesar, Ellen, Frank, and Bessie are juridically free people. And so maintaining order on these former plantations was tricky. And so he's suggesting that Mercer buy medals to award these formerly enslaved people for being faithful perfectly faithful, to use his own words. And why I thought this letter was interesting, because it just shows you that fashion and accessories were sort of embedded in maintaining order on plantations, even in a post-emancipation society, which is the case for this moment in, in 1865. So fashion is an incentive 
as I previously stated, um, overseers, enslaved domestic, and favorite and or productive enslaved persons um, sometimes received fine garments that were manufactured in the Northeast. Enslaved people were thus encouraged by a system of awards that included both hand-me-downs and new garments. Fashion was thus embedded in the system of awards and punishments that helped the plantations and slave societies. And in the case that I just showed you in the previous slide, post-emancipation societies run smoothly. And I have another example of that. This is an article that was written about a man named Peter Fawcett. Let's see him, his name right here. Peter Fawcett, um, this article is from 1898, um, but he was raised um, in, at Monticello in Thomas Jefferson's household. So you can imagine in 1898, he was quite elderly by that moment, but he was sort of reminiscing of his time at Monticello and being a young enslaved boy on the Thomas Jefferson's household. And one, thing, one of the things that he mentions in this article is that he dressed differently um, than other um, enslaved boys because he worked inside the house. And you can even see it from this illustration here. He's wearing um, white, what might be a livery. The Fawcett's were in some ways similar to the Hemings. It's a family that had, there was little social distance between them and the Jefferson family. But unlike the Hemings, the Fawcett family didn't intermarry in the Jefferson family. So back to the coats. Um, there's one important detail that I would like us to, to bring to our attention. Um, if you really look closely at the buttons of the coat, you can see that they're custom. The buttons have little falcons on them, and that's important because the Mercer family crest has falcons on them. Um, and so the enslaved or the boy or man who wore these coats uh, were sort of emblazoned with symbols of the family. This is a silver tray that's also in the permanent collection of the Historic New Orleans collection, and it's also from the Mercer household. And as you can see, there's uh, a, a little falcon on it, and there's an M um, for Mercer. And so enslaved people were essentially used as luxury items, sort of stamped with emblazoned with symbols that represented the family's wealth. And that's not unusual for livery. Here's another example. This is a coat that's in the permanent collection of the Maryland um, Historical Society. And this is a coat that was worn by um, a man that was born into slavery. Um, but um, um, his, when he wore this coat, he was formerly enslaved. Um, but this is um, from the Ridgely family, and the Ridgely family had a stag on their family crest. And so the buttons of this coat also have a stag on them. And you see stags throughout the estate or plantation. Um, so this is a tie back for a heavy velvet curtain, and it's, it's shaped like a stag. So this wasn't unusual for um, one, decorative arts um, within these households, but also the ways in which enslaved people or formerly enslaved people were outfitted. But I do want to talk about Brooks Brothers, bring it back to the, the history of the company. This is an image from 1845. The first Brooks Brothers was on the corner of Catherine and Cherry Streets, um, which would be sort of present day Lower East Side or Two Bridges. That's an important location because it was only a few blocks away from ports, um, international ports, and also ports that were connected to other parts of the United States. It also wasn't far from um, slave ports. Of course, by 1865 in New York State, 
slavery had been a bit abolished, but that history still lied in, in the neighborhood to a certain extent. So this is just a screenshot of a modern day map of New York City. You can see um, where the Brooks Brothers location was here. And location is really important. So the first Brooks Brothers was in Lower Manhattan, present day Lower East Side. Um, it moved to, to present day Soho, to the corner of Broadway and Grand, going back, thinking of that label that I showed you. Um, and those two locations were open simultaneously. Then it moved to um, Union Square. And then of course the present day Brooks Brothers it has several locations, but the, the, the flagship is in Midtown. But when Brooks Brothers had a location in Union Square, um, its neighbor was Tiffany and Company. So if you can, and thankfully, you know, I have a, an audience of New Yorkers, so you can envision like a 19th century, a late 19th century Union Square. If you think about Union Square South and where that Whole Foods is located, that's where the Brooks Brothers location was. Of course, that building there that's there now is new. Um, the Brooks Brothers built, whatever building the Brooks Brothers was in has been torn down, um, but that's where it was located. And its neighbor, when it was there, was, was Tiffany and Company, um, you know, the fine goods store. So Tiffany and Company was founded in 1837 by the 25 year old Charles Lewis Tiffany with a thousand dollar loan from his father, Comfort Tiffany. And so initially the retailer sold fine silver and other luxury goods, but it soon became famous for his watches, clocks and fine jewelry. But Tiffany Company has, is another example of a company that sort of highlights the relationship between um, raw materials that were produced in the South and manufacturers and retailers in the North. So Comfort Tiffany, um, who was Charles Lewis Tiffany's father, was part owner of several Connecticut cotton mills that processed cotton that was picked by enslaved people. So thinking about the history of the company, without the startup cut capital, which would be roughly about $27,000 a day that was generated in part from the unpaid labor of enslaved people, we wouldn't have Tiffany and companies, Tiffany and company today. This is another document that I analyze in a chapter. Um, it's referred to as the Taylor's Appeal, a group of firms that were based in the Northeast took out an ad in several newspapers, like the New York, this is from the New York Tribune, but they also put this out in, in a number of other newspapers throughout the Northeast. And actually this research started with this article. Yeah, and from this article, I, I branched out and found the other sources um, on which I based this chapter. Um, but these firms complained that what they refer to as Southern work employers, our enslavers weren't paying their bills on time. And they signed their names at the bottom of the complaint. So if you squint, you can see that number 29 here um, is Brooks Brothers. So again, just another obvious connection between the company Brooks Brothers and slavery. I've done a lot of research on this, this document and um, most of these firms don't exist anymore. Um, there are a few recognizable names. Um, if you've heard of Rogers Pete, which is a, a menswear company that's now defunct, but had, had a history of over, was around for over a century. I think it closed in the 1980s. Um, Rogers and Company was a precursor to Rogers Pete. And if you heard of the, the bank Brown Brothers, it's also on its list. 
Well, this is a, a really interesting document for a number of reasons. And as far as I know, Rogers, Pete, and Brown Brothers haven't um, had a like initiated conversation about their connection to slavery. I know I'm running very low on time, so I'm not going to go into exhaustive detail about this. But one, one thing that I think is interesting about Brooks Brothers is sort of the 20th and 21st his 21st century history of the company. Um, its archive is managed by a private company called the History Factory. And History Factory was found in the late 70s by a man who happens to be a Brooks Brothers enthusiast. It's a corporate archive management firm. And when he founded the company, he reached out to Brooks Brothers and offered to manage their archive. And at the time, Brooks Brothers wasn't doing well financially. It still isn't. Um, but their reaction to the offer was fine. Take the archive, like we're going under, who cares? And so he managed the archive on his own dime for a number of years. And it wasn't able until the, the company had a financial turnaround under the helm of a, um, this wealthy Italian magnate named Claudio Del Vecchio that they started, they were able to pay the history factory. Um, since then, um, the history factory has evolved. And now it's more than just a corporate archive management firm. It sort of uh, manages brand narratives, particularly for heritage brands. So this is a screenshot from a report that they put out recently. And as you can see, it's sort of offering its services to potential new clients. And I think the images that they use are really interesting. You can see on the, the right is a protest um, for equal pay um, to you know, close the, the, the pay gap between men and women. On the left, you see the image, and images of smokestacks. So I was like, history, the companies that have a history of pollution, like how to manage that history. And then, of course, in the middle, you see a line drawing of a slave ship um, in the 19th century. Basically, this report was teaching or offering you know, companies how to manage the perils of the past, what companies should know about their histories and how to manage them. So there, you know, I haven't had been able to get access to Brooks Brothers archives because the history factory is very um, careful about who they allow to have access um, to the archive there you know brooks brothers what it's selling is its heritage it's a clothing company that's over 200 years old and as we all know that the, the brooks brothers is not doing very well so so any negative press um would sort of create a, a further blow to the company um so it's interesting how the history factory and just the name alone, the History Factory, is really interesting, but how it sort of like navigated um, all these problematic histories. So I can talk more about that maybe in the Q&A, because um, I think that's really fascinating and is actually key to the story that I want to tell. But to sum up, because I feel like I've been talking for a long time, um, Brooks Brothers is fully embedded in American history, which includes the most American of institutions, slavery. The success and longevity of Brooks Brothers is due in part to its connection to slavery and the profits it gained from selling clothing to planters in the South. By counting slaveholders among its clientele, Brooks Brothers directly benefited from the buying and selling of enslaved men, women, and children. Um, so I, see, I just want to invite you to follow me on social media. I'm very active. Um, I often share many of these find findings online, um, so feel free to follow me. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing, and I would love to hear any thoughts that you all may have um, about my research. Jonathan, thank you very much. I invite um, my colleagues, panelists here, to uh, make themselves visible and uh, ask away. And those of you in uh, what used to be the studio audience, 
please send in your uh, questions as well. I'm happy to, uh, to present them. Okay. So I can, I can give you the green light, Catherine, go right ahead. Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, thank you so much. This is just a really amazing presentation, Jonathan, and really interesting work. Um, and I have a variety of questions, so I'm going to put them out there and maybe answer one so that other people have a chance to talk and if they relate to each other, great, and if they don't, they don't. Um, so there were a couple things that you mentioned in your presentation that I'm curious about. One was you were looking at this garment and you were saying, okay, I'm going to focus on the 19th century history and not the 20th and 21st century history, but I kind of felt like that was maybe a drop for us to ask about that. Um, and then the other was um, kind of about, you know, your research methodology, because you're looking at collections, you're looking at archives, um, you're looking at other kinds of uh, resources. Um, and I was, you showed a couple things related to um, historic New Orleans. Uh, and I was curious about um, what kinds of objects you were culling or finding useful there. I know that um, just a little, a little um, backstory is that um, Sarah Duggan came here a couple of years ago to talk about their um, decorative arts of the Gulf um, South documentation project, um, where people are going out, you know, often students to um, plantations or other, um, you know, longstanding homes or collections and documenting, you know, different kinds of decorative arts. And part of that was some really interesting conversations about the people who still had those kinds of objects. Um, that related uh, to their, um, not only their family history, but sort of the long history of um, plantation ownership, enslavement, interpretation, uh, who had that stuff. So the other one is, I'm really curious about the fashion and race database, which I and students have found a, a great resource, which I think you've worked on. Um, and then also I, a little bit of a starstruck about Mel Painter. So if there's any of those <laughs> that, that interest you, um, I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll try to address all of them quickly. Yeah, I mean, one, it was just an honor to be able to work with Nell Painter. Yeah. I curated two exhibitions of her work. And the reason why I'm really inspired by her and her work is um, I consider myself to be a creative person. I'm an esteem, like I love art and fashion, but I'm also a historian. Mm -hmm. And I've also, I found, I've had trouble sort of navigating both of those sides of myself. And I think she's done it really deftly. So she worked as a historian for decades. Um, and when she um, retired, she went back to art, she went to art school and got a BFA, and then a MFA from RISD. And now she's a professional artist. Um, so it was, just, it was just a pleasure and an honor to like collaborate with her on those exhibitions. So um, yeah, that, um, and then, um, Let's see, your other historic New Orleans collection. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, the, the silver tray that I showed you was actually collected in that process that you refer to. Um, it was the coats and then the silver tray were in a, a home um, in St. Francisville. And the family who had descended from enslavers donated the objects to the historic New Orleans collection. So it's interesting how the institution sort of navigates that history and sort of make sure that marginalized individuals um, are enslaved people and their descendants are sort of incorporated into the history of these objects. And, you know, they're learning how to do that um, in, in their own way, um, but they're, you know, they've also have made some mistakes in the past. Um, and then um, 20th century history. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. I mean, I think, I think a lot about the history of Brooks Brothers, um, particularly now because it's, it's bankrupt Again, um, it struggled since I'd say the 1970s. Just people are wearing less suits. People are e wearing even less suits during the pandemic. Um, and the company was already on shaky, shaky footing, um, but the pandemic like, tanked it. Um, so it's sort of, it had a moment of resurgence. Like, you know, the, like you think about the early 2000s, where like, there was a moment of like Americana preppy collegiate wear, um, it had a, like a resurgence if you, um, but again, it's, 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 it's suffering again. And, you know, you know, I really wish that people were less precious with Brooks Brothers. Um, Cause the thing about fashion is that, you know, it has to change 
constantly has to be you know hip to like current conversations and there are many people who just won't allow brooks brothers to to do that um i really wish they would like hire like a designer that had a, a more sort of avant-garde or like younger perspective maybe brooks brothers would collaborate with adidas or puma or nike or create a sneaker that one could wear with suiting or you know hire someone like jerry lorenzo who has a brand called fear of god or kanye west or greg lauren someone who sort of sort of juggles american codes but sort of wouldn't deal with brooks brothers in such a precious way um, because it's sort of ossified mm -hmm. it's not evolving and that's the problem with the brand. Um, so I think just the present day history of Brooks Brothers is really interesting. Even though this chapter focuses on like the 19th century, I think 20th century histories of the brand are really fascinating as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Um, next questions I have queued up, uh, Amelia and Sonia. Hi, nice to meet you in person. We just emailed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, I, I had sort of three very much Brooks Brother focused questions, which one of which is where was the fabric itself coming from? Was it American fabric? Was it British fabric? I think the liveries are mostly wool, um, but I don't know. So that was one. Um, and why Brooks Brothers in particular? Because from some research I've done on furniture, Natchez was very uh, closely associated with Philadelphia and a lot of the furniture from that period that's in the Natchez houses is actually was sourced in Philadelphia. So that's sort of a weird thing. And finally, what do you think the extent of the market that Brooks Brothers, you know, the livery, um, how much of their market was in livery? Great questions. Yeah, I mean, I don't know because I haven't been granted access to Brooks Brothers archive. In all honesty, I have a friend who studies like the history of suiting and menswear. And like the topic is just less controversial. So she's been granted access. And she's told me that there's really not that much 19th century material in the archive. So I'm not really missing anything. Um, but I don't know, like, I feel like that's a question I can answer if I was able to get access to some financial records or some of those documents from the, the 19th century. Um, I do have to say there was a livery catalog in the 19th century. Um, so I don't think it was a small component of their business. I don't think it was the main component. I think the main component was like suiting for elite men in the Northeast. But I do think in the late 19th century, it, it, it had to be maybe 30, 20, 10% of their business, if I had to guess. Yeah. And um, your question about um, where the fabric was sourced, you know, I don't know. I really don't. You're right that it's wool, the line in the silk. Um, but I don't know where the fabric was sourced. Um, so that's something I, I mean, I would love to figure yeah, that out. It, I guess I, what I'm thinking is that most of the factories that are making wool and cotton are all up Northeast. And so it'd be really kind of interesting to see that connection as well. Mm. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. Actually, that was a third question that I didn't answer. What was your third oh, it question? It was just, I guess, whether Brooks Brothers, I, I, there were other companies that I were, were making livery besides Brooks Brothers, correct? Absolutely. So yeah. I was just curious, you know, was it, was it uh, Mercer's New York Connections that he, for instance, chose Brooks Brothers um, because um, why, why Brooks Brothers, why, you know, for him, versus a Philadelphia maker or somewhere else. But just, just all these things need more research, clearly. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like yeah. he was in New York. So, and Brooks Brothers was based in New York. So I'm sure that's one reason. Also, he just shopped a lot. So he probably <laughs> shopped at other places as well. But for whatever reason, the Brooks Brothers coats were preserved. And I think that's a really interesting question. Like why were these, both of these coats were preserved? Do you think Brooks Brothers had more status than perhaps other brands? I wonder. I mean, in the 19th century, Brooks Brothers wasn't as hoity-toity as it was now. Like, Brooks Brothers in the 19th century was like men's warehouse. Like, you would go to Brooks, like, it, you know, often Brooks Brothers tells that it was the first company to sort of make ready-made suiting. But the reason that it made ready-made suiting, because it outfitted soldiers 
in domestics and enslaved people, like the kind of people who couldn't walk into a Brooks Brothers location and get custom suiting. That's why it has ready-made suiting. So it, it provided suiting on many different levels. That's why I say it's like men's warehouse. If you want to spend like a few thousand on a suit at men's warehouse, you can. If you want to spend $90 on a suit at men's warehouse, you can. And Brooks Brothers was similar in the 19th century. It wasn't until the 20th century when it started thinking of itself as a heritage brand that it started to sort of become gentrified and associated with like waspiness. Um, so. Thanks very much. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, Sonia, please. Hi, thank you. Um, great presentation. I look at heritage branding in the 20th century, so this is like a really good crossover in a lot of ways. Um, and I, you just kind of touched on some of the things I was I was hoping to bring up, which was, I mean, they were making like ready-made slops for sailors to wear on the wharves of the East River at the, around the same time. And, and I also doubt that their archive would have a great deal of that because that again is not as politically charged as discussing things that were worn or owned by enslaved people, but it's still not something the brand is particularly proud of and built their image off of. Um, but you know, who, there are military collectors that are private that might have something like that. And I'd be very curious to see how close that those kinds of garments resemble um, the, the jackets that you were able to find because there might be some parallels there. Um, Cause often those private collectors can have a lot of very old material that cultural institutions never cared about. <laughs> Um, so that could that could be something, and also too, I mean, the their whole Americanness has always been a little bit weird. I mean, their logo, that little strung up sheep, is like the Order of the Golden Fleece from like medieval Europe. And I'm trying to think of like um, you probably know better when they first started using that and bringing kind of. I feel like they're they were they're grasping at straws with different kinds of elite imagery in their branding that doesn't never lined up with what they were making. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, lo I love your first comment about like maybe consulting with a, a private collector of like military uniforms. I never even thought about that, but you're absolutely right. I would love to compare the coats to maybe like a Brooks Brothers uniform um, from the late 19th century. What's interesting about these coats is that they're actually well-made, which is one of the reasons why they, they held up. And I also think because they were well-made, that's one of the reasons why they were preserved. Like they were valuable. They weren't thrown out um, because of the, the custom buttons, like the silk lining. What's also really interesting about the coats is that they're, it's full of pockets. And as someone who studies like enslaved people's dress, it's unusual to have so many pockets. If there's a pocket in a garment made specifically for an enslaved person, it's very functional. Like you often see like long pockets on like for aprons or long skirts, but that's because the person needed those pockets for work. Typically the pockets, there weren't pockets in garments made for enslaved people because there's a lot of power in pockets. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a, there's a reason why, you know, clothing made for female identifying individuals often don't have pockets in it because you can use pockets to hide weapons or right. to steal things. Or like, there's a lot of power in having pockets in your clothing. So the clothing for enslaved people often didn't have pockets in it. So I think it's interesting that the, these coats are full of pockets. Mm -hmm. Like the cutaway coat that I showed you has pockets in the, the cutaway flap in the back of the coat. Right, that's so different from like a big patch pocket on the outside where you can see what's in there and like the functionality that you just said. So, so that makes it, so maybe they were, do you think they were one of these hand-me-down garments perhaps? Like they, they could swap out the buttons to make it look more like livery, but do you think that it might, that might be part of the narrative or, I mean, it's all speculative, I guess, but. I think it was livery. I think it was made specifically for um, a domestic. Um, and in this case, the, a butler or a valet and they were enslaved. Um, just because of the details of it. Um, and also the fact that Brooks Brothers had a livery department. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in with a couple of questions from the audience that are related to just this point. So the first one is uh, from Susan Kern uh, asking if a Brooks Brothers coat made for an enslaved person has a different kind of quality or quality finish than coats made for uh, free owners or made for their owners. Uh, and then uh, Deborah Crone is asking uh, both how many garments of this sort have survived and what about women's clothing? 
in particular? Yeah, I mean, this kind of goes back to um, Sonia's comments and questions. Yeah, like the style of the coats just aren't consistent with like suiting made for an elite person in the late 19th century. Like it looks like livery, like the custom buttons with the, the falcon on it, like the number of pockets on the coat, um, sort of the over designed quality that's akin to like um, a train conductor or like circus perform. Like there, there's just something like it's a bit extra. Um, so it looks like livery um, for me. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's an important difference between like regular suiting as opposed to livery. Um, but also like the second question was about um, how many exemplars of coats like this are left. Um, you know, I would love to identify more. So if, if anyone here knows of any, <laughs> um, you know, Brooks Brothers um, like livery from the late 19th century, please reach out to me because I would like to identify more. Um, uh, it's only these two coats that I've been able to identify. Um, and in terms of women's clothing, Brooks Brothers didn't start manufacturing clothing for um, women until the mid 20th century, um, if I believe. Um, so it, it's, it's very much a, a menswear brand. Um, women's wear has always been marginal um, to its business. So. But it did, it did hire, um, what's his face? Um, young American designer, Zach Posen, um, in an attempt to sort of like revive the brand, um, I think in probably the early 2000s. Um, so it has dabbled in women's wear. Thanks. Uh, next question from the panel, uh, I have from Kate Seculus. Thank you. Thank you, that was amazing. I love this article, it's such brilliant sleuthing. And I'm wondering, I'm fascinated horribly by the history factory and how, I mean, do, I'm wondering sort of what volume of um, companies archives are they in control of? Do they have some kind of contract whereby they cede control from the company? If Brooks Brothers had let you in, would they have done that? Do you imagine they would have wanted you out anyway? <laughs> Have you any idea what their attitude is to your research? And is it all filtered through this history company? So I want to know sort of how, how important are they? And is it fashion or is it all sorts of, I mean, I should look them up. I just didn't know them before. So, I mean, what, what are the rules for getting around this kind of um, not very, um, it doesn't seem very ethical. So any thoughts on all of that? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I mean, the History Factory are the gatekeepers to the archive. I'm not sure to what degree Brooks Brothers is aware of my research. And of course, Brooks Brothers is kind of in shambles right now. Um, you know, so I don't think they're even concerned about my research, honestly. I think they're just more concerned with like staying afloat. I do know for a fact that the History Factory is aware of my research because I called them. <laughs> And requested access to their um, to the archive, so I imagine um, they've googled my name, and probably the first thing that comes up is slavery, and they're like, "Oh no, <laughs> never mind, we can't give them access." Um, I have recently been connected with um, the founder of the um, History Factory, so um, I do need to just like set sign aside to like talk to him and like pick his brain because I would be curious to see. What he has to say, I just haven't had time to do it, but I do have his his personal email. So, thanks. I'd be really fascinated to hear what happens there. <laughs> I want to record the conversation. I don't know if he would would allow that. <laughs> These days, you just say, "Can we zoom?" and then you say, "You know, oops, it's automatically recording to you." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to say that uh, Peter had to jump off, and so he asked me to um, finish up with the moderating. Uh, moderating, and um, I know maybe time for one more question. And I know Michelle, you've you've had your hand up for a bit, so do you want to share your question with us? Uh, sure, I'd love to. Thanks, thanks, Jonathan. It's great to see you. Fabulous, <laughs> fabulous presentation. Um, I'm so excited about the book too. Um, and I think Deborah was asking about extant examples of you know actual objects, you know, and from Kind of the curatorial perspective, I'm always interested in finding those specific objects. So 
Um, I was curious about that, which I think you already answered, but also like the visual record, you know, I mean, how much can you actually find in terms of a visual record related to your research? That must be somewhat challenging in many ways. So I'm just curious about that. It's really tricky. Mm -hmm. I mean, I pretty much presented all the visuals that I have for the chapter. Um, I mean, there's promotional images of like advertisements for Brooks Brothers in the 19th century that I could, could possibly like draw something from. Mm -hmm. There just aren't a lot of visuals. And maybe again, if I had access to the Brooks Brothers archive, there might be something of use there. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, I'm, I'm sort of getting at this through triangulation through like other sources. Mm -hmm. um, so like the visual record is, is, is scant. Um, yeah. And the like the Baltimore coat that you showed, how did you kind of get to that, for example, the one in the Baltimore Museum? Is it the Baltimore Museum? Is that, am I saying oh, that? Um, the, yeah. the Maryland Historical Society. Maryland Historical Sorry. Yeah. 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 How, how did you kind of get to that? I'm just curious about how you find something like that. Yeah, actually, I presented it at the CAA. Mm -hmm. And there was someone who was attending who um, um, is based in Baltimore. And she suggested it, and I, it wasn't on my radar. I didn't know about this delivery in the permanent collection of the, the Maryland Historical Society. So it was through, again, like I said, I love presenting my research because I mean, for so, like a rarefied audience like this, it's often, there's so many smart people and they make suggestions for my research. So it was actually a fashion scholar who was in attendance um, who suggested it, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Jonathan, um, thank you so much. Uh, we, I, we don't want to keep you any longer, but may I ask if people have questions, can they get in touch with you? Um, of course. And learn more about your work. Please, um, yeah. Um, you can should I put my email in the chat. Okay. Maybe. Okay. Let's see. Yes. Okay. I'll put my email in the chat. Feel free to reach out. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. It's a really interesting topic, and I know many of us are interested in this topic, and we're also learning more about it. So it's really wonderful to have your presentation um, and learn from you. Uh, so thank you. No, this is great. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you.